Bethesda is a company with millions of diehard fans, multiple insanely successful titles, millions of dollars, and they make terrible video games. Now, I'm specifically talking about the CRPGs they produce, Elder Scrolls and Fallout. While I haven't played much of Morrowind because of the fact that I'm a little child born in this millennia, I've spent a considerable amount of time with their other 3D CRPGs. And after a while of roaming these worlds, I genuinely get sick of these games. After finishing 3 once I never really went back to it even though I praised the game back when I was 13, I never finished the main storylines for both Oblivion and Skyrim until starting to work on this video, and even diehard Bethesda fans seem to be on the fence with Fallout 4. While all of these CRPGs seem to be shallow but huge, like that overdone joke Shemi joked about in his jokey review, there are still hundreds of thousands of people who love these games, and there are people I know in real life who get really heated when I say I find Skyrim's combat boring, its story tiresome, and its world unoriginal. So how come all these people love these games so much and even consider them masterpieces while well, some other people, including me, think they're just flawed, mediocre RPGs? I must be wrong to some extent if everybody loves these games this much, right? Right? Well, that's why I'm making this video, to attempt to find an answer to that question. How come all these flawed games have such a cult following, willing to throw hands the moment someone talks them down? Maybe my history with Bethesda's games could be a good starting point. The first interaction I had with Bethesda was Fallout 3. I was 13 and loved the game so much that right after finishing the game once, I went onto my blogger blog and rambled on about that game for a full page. After that I've never touched that game for years and when I tried to go back I could never get immersed like the first time. Then came Oblivion for me, I had fun for a couple of hours, killed some, saved some, ran some, and then the whole game with its over the top bloom and greenest of greeds and boring portals to hell just faded away and I didn't bother finishing it. Then came my dear new Vegas. At first I didn't realize how much more immersed I was with it, thinking it was just Fallout 3 but in a desert. I kept playing the game for hours on end for days. One time while playing on a weeknight, I thought that it was like midnight or 1am or something like that and I would go to sleep after finishing the small side quest while I was finishing the quest. My mom woke up for work. It was 8.30 in the morning. Finished it, took a week or two off, then restarted with a different character. Played it, finished it again and again until I was overwhelmed, wanting to play something else. A couple years went by trying to replay Fallout 3, being disappointed, playing other games, drowning in schoolwork, and one day I saw a cheap secondhand copy of Skyrim, so I bought it and spent a week or two playing it. And I remember this time really vividly. I started the game completely ecstatic. I had just read Beowulf for the first time back then, and now I myself could be an epic hero. I was a dragonborn, I was gonna slay dragons, save kingdoms and kill a whole bunch of people while doing so and as vividly I remember the excitement I had at the start of the game, I remember how quickly the excitement deteriorated as well. Until Skyrim faded away from my daily routine and mind just like Oblivion did when I was 13. So yeah, I never really got into any other Bethesda game than the one they didn't make. So, seeing my friends' eyes get widened with light shining in them got weirder and weirder every time I talked about Bethesda games. I felt left out, I felt like I was missing something. Every time I said I couldn't get into Skyrim, people looked at me like I was some sort of a heretic. At least every 4 out of 10 people that I met said that Skyrim was one of their all-time favorite video games. So after going through all that, I decided to give another chance to Bethesda. However, after playing these games a bit more, actively thinking about them and watching hour long, sometimes even longer critiques on these games, I realized I wasn't alone in my feelings and Skyrim's combat was actually boring. Fallout 3 was actually a terrible role-playing game, vastly inferior to New Vegas, and Fallout 4 wasn't that much different than the games preceding it, but people were just getting sick of these shallow worlds. So just like that I just stopped playing or caring about any of these games and decided that people just weren't critical enough. Some time passed on, many new ideas about video games and game design were acquired, many open world adventure games were finished, and now I was a couple of years closer to death, ready to give another chance to Bethesda, like two months ago. 
going back to Skyrim, going back to Fallout 3 and even Oblivion, after all that time I noticed something. They had a certain charming feel that a really small amount of games came close to Bethesda's in having that sugar coating of feelings. It wasn't any discovery or anything, I just had nothing else to compare these games to the first time I played them. Most of the games I played up until first playing Fallout 3 didn't even come close to Bethesda's in terms of sheer scale. It was not a eureka moment where something finally clicks and now I understand and enjoy all things Bethesda but more of a oh, this is why everybody loves these games kinda moment. I remember having a similar feeling while playing the first Red Dead Redemption as well. Come to think of it, it's a feeling I had while playing most of the Rockstar's games. The settings, the living cities, the dedication to detailing every single element of the game. Hundreds oh of Lord, random NPC blind. lines in San Andreas. The way your character moves on Storm in Red Dead Redemption 2. The many ways you can bully kids in Bully. The list goes on. The good thing is these whole detailed worlds are not empty at all. They are full of things to do, full of specific events and explorable optional content and that is the exact reason why these games feel the way they do. They are worlds. They are living, breathing, detailed worlds, the actual main characters of these games. It is not the story that pulls you into Los Santos, it is its people, its shops and all the things you can just do and don't even have to do. This sea of optional content on top of these living worlds cause the game to feel like a place you can escape to, a world where you're free to do what you can't in the real one and you don't even have to think about consequences because they don't exist in this poorly thought out, badly designed messes of worlds. Escapism, isn't that one of the biggest attractions of any kind of entertainment? You can escape from your daily monotone routine into these colorful, sometimes dreadful worlds where you're free to shoot people and build a settlement and play some stupid card game and maybe even do some favors for people you don't even like just for money. And you don't have to think about a single damn thing you're doing. You can just switch your brain off and merely exist in these worlds. That is where Bethesda's games differ from other open world adventures. Busy work and their consequence free nature. They might have boring combat, one dimensional role playing options and terrible bugs and they can get away with it. Because I don't know any other game where you can collect butterflies and flowers, be a coal miner and kill dragons and also have believable virtual people you can romance and befriend and do all kinds of stuff with who also react to you in a realistic-ish way and you can do all of this in a three-dimensional fantasy land where you can do the most outrageous acts and the world seems to not even care. What else can one ask for? Fallout as a series has been thoroughly about role-playing as a character in an unforgiving environment and exploring the people of the wasteland, experiencing their isolation from others, their paranoia, their struggles to survive in this cruel world and living out your own story as you see fit. Bethesda took this dreadful place and turned it into a world where you blow up giants with market strollers taped to their backs with small nuclear bombs while listening to 1950s cheerful music when they developed Fallout 3. They took all the dread of this harsh and greedy world and threw it all into the trash in favor of humorous characters and kids with guns in caves. Yes, this isn't exactly a bad thing per se, it's not required to illustrate a world full of murder and desperation in a serious tone with dramatic stories. You can do the exact opposite and provide an entertaining and content adventure. Even though it's not the Fallout way of doing things, I am fine with Bethesda making the world less serious. What I do have a problem with is how the game acts like it has a deep and dramatic world and criticizes the human nature while also having a dude howling on the radio and a main storyline with a genocidal cartoon evil AI, a bad parenting example and morally complex dilemmas such as and you get a town full of people or fucking don't. This lack of competence from the developers had the side effect of making the game so accessible in ways they didn't even intend to. Yes, accessibility was a big thing that was focused on while creating Fallout 3. You can see this attention to simpleness very blatantly from how you start the game in the middle of the map and can wander off to any direction without anywhere on the base providing you a lethal challenge or how you can skip most of the missions by pickpocketing, looking into lockers and dice rolls or how you can get every piece of weaponry you might need until the end of time so early in the game you can simply finish the main storyline with the guns you get in the first hour of the game. The incompetence part comes mainly in terms of writing, where you can't do anything but follow your father's footsteps who actually makes every decision for you, or following a brotherhood paladin who makes every actual decision for you. This causes nothing to have any actual weight. 
no hard decisions, no danger to characters from your actions, and no consequences. Fallout 3 is a playground that acts like a cold, harsh, post-apocalyptic world. A playground you can play in forever if you can get over the writing and the shallowness of everything. That is where the busy work I talked about comes into play. If you simply ignore this lack of competence, you are still left with a world which acts like it has depth and you are important, where you are free to survive the way you see fit. Help the people dwelling the ruins of the old world. Be the lone wanderer or be a genocidal maniac cannibalizing people or go collect some toys or comics or you know, become a slaver. The amount of things you can do in this game and how nothing really has a consequence deceived people who didn't have much time to play video games truly or people who didn't want to think while playing video games into feeling they just finished an adventure where they were an important player in deciding the fate of the capital life then. Instead, they were just watching a slightly interactive movie of a scientist willing to die for his ideals, pursue a virtuous cause, and after that being left alone to wander a wasteland full of either murderous maniacs or goody two-shoes. A place like this doesn't provide much for its inhabitants to do other than kill each other, survive and scavenge, so the busy work is actually a bit limited. Yet Fallout 4 still found ways to turn up the busy work dial to an 11. The game has an even more boring storyline than 3, even less role-playing options, randomly generated annoying-ass quests, and even less consequences for the player's actions, but tons and tons of busy work on top of even more busy work. Make a castle, populate the castle, scavenge items to craft weapons, provide electricity to the castle, build a power armor, help other castles, swag out your power armor, swag out your weapons, swag out your castle, craft whatever you want. Do all of this on top of being able to do all of the things you used to be able to do back in Fallout 3. I'm not saying any of these systems are well designed, interesting or impressive, rather the fact that you have things to do that you might end up wanting to do because you want to have your home place, you want to make it a better place, live your post-apocalyptic fantasies in a world that doesn't really make sense. As high as a flag on the 4th of July If you'll excuse an expression I use I'm in love, I'm in love, I'm in love, I'm in love, I'm in love With a wonderful guy The Elder Scrolls, on the other hand, dials that thing to do dial up from an 11 to a 25 Oblivion has some well-written quest lines, fun moments and a medieval romance vibe But the spammy boring combat of Skyrim has its roots in this game the combat is one of the worst parts of the game. It isn't clear when you attack someone if they just got bashed over the head with a warhammer or they are remotely annoyed of your otherworldly face. In addition to these anticlimactic combat mechanics, portals to oblivion seem cool as hell the first time you see one, but when you go into it and clear the tower, the excitement leaves its place for disappointment. These gates don't provide satisfying challenges, and the worst of all, they are repetitive, copied and plastered all over the game world. Ugly faces, sloppy combat and mediocre dungeons do hinder the experience, but not to the level of an oversight, pretty much making the game agonizing to play for certain character builds. Oblivion doesn't have leveled areas and mobs, instead has the whole world level with you. This is totally okay, many open world games have the same system to keep the game a constant challenge for the player in higher levels, and make every single location of the map explorable for the player the moment they step out of that cave. The problem with Oblivion's system is when you level up anything other than hand-to-hand -hand combat related skills, i.e. if you press the jump button one too many times, the game still levels up mobs around the world with you and the player has no say over what they are going to level up because every action from taking damage to walking remotely faster levels up your character. Meaning if you have a playstyle focused on sneaking around, talking your way out of problems and jumping over rocks, by the time you reach late game, it will probably take around 300 blows with a sword to kill a mob, and on top of all of that, none of your actions feel like it has weight whether you steal a fork or turn into an evil assassin. It feels like your character doesn't change a bit over the course of the game, or nothing in the world is different compared to the first time you left that cave. But the game has that moment where you leave the cave. It has the Dark Brotherhood, the bloated float in, many memorable moments, stories and places. Even though it's a float game, it's a memorable one, with its unique nature. It gives you your own medieval romance to run around in, a humorous world full of content and people to talk to and 
things to do and guilds to join and Skyrim focuses on this optional side of things and takes it to a whole other level. In Skyrim the combat is still a spam fest but an improved one at that. Level system finally works, the main storyline is boring as usual with all these games and the role playing experience is non-existent in terms of writing. However, now there is more optional accessible busy work than ever. With many streamlined simple systems there is not an end to amount of things you can do just for the fun of it. You can craft the weapons you want from scratch and turn them into unique personal toys. Let's say you want to craft an overpowered cool looking sword. You first need to mine the ore you need, melt them in a forge, smith your new sword on the anvil, then refine it again with more iron, and then enchant it and then refine it even further with enhanced smithing portions. And make that sword into an even more broken item by using enchanting enhancer portions. But to create this god item you'll need a high skill of smithing, so you'll need to craft many items to get better at smithing. You'll need a high skill of enchanting, so you'll start enchanting every item you see to get better at it. And to brew those portions you'll need a high alchemy skill, so you'll spend a considerable amount collecting flowers, spider eggs and all kinds of random items to brew portions. After dedicating all this time into a virtual sword, your efforts will bear its fruits into making the game more fun, enjoyable and easy for you. There is tons of optional busy work in Skyrim with interlacing systems just like the ones I talked about. You can spend hundreds of hours just living in this world and being a blacksmith. You don't have to be a hero, a dragon slayer or anything to enjoy and exist in this world. Well, in terms of how these optional systems are designed and work, in terms of writing, you can only be the bringer of peace and the hero Skyrim needs. And the writing is the biggest offender of Skyrim's consequence free nature. When nothing you do truly impacts anything and you can't choose anything other than which cool armor you are going to wear, it all just becomes meaningless. The role-playing aspect is not in the writing or the storyline, you role-play in this world as whoever you want to be, forgetting about the greater story. Skyrim is just a place with tools to use to weave your own path. And I think that is the single biggest reason your pal who doesn't even play video games anymore still loves Skyrim and goes back to it every then and again just to check up on his character and go around catching up with their old friend. Many people who play these games don't really care for the story as far as I can tell. Skyrim is more of a place than a game to create your own narrative and that is the same with many things Bethesda. Fallout 3 and 4 are your places to wander in. Places ruined by human greed that is just a mere reflection of the old world. Now with fun things to find and a whole state to explore. Oblivion is your own fairy tale to be a part of, or a courtly romance, or a tremendous epic about a hero. You are that hero. It is up to you to decide what fantasy you'll act like you're living in. I'm saying act like because all of these games like the focus, polish and intricacy to make them good role playing games, where you can live out these fantasies to the extent you're imagining them. Bethesda had the money and manpower to create these huge worlds full of mediocre content and win the hearts of masses, because nobody else with the same resources did what they did back then. That is the Bethesda feeling, that is why your friend still plays Skyrim to this day. That is why people think of me as a gaming heretic when I say I don't like Skyrim. That is why reviewers gave Fallout 3 incredible amounts of praise when it came out because there was nothing else like it. No other game came close to letting people loose in worlds like these games did. And the ones who came close were dumb down, pick up play, come back two weeks later and play some more type of games. Most role-playing games are adventures you have to think about your actions and decisions have consequences. However, Big B wasn't good at making your decisions have meaning and consequence and they didn't have to. Bethesda didn't have to be good at what they were doing because they were pioneers. Being a pioneer isn't a positive thing by definition but the head start they had let them conquer the CRPG land. Being the first to provide enormous adventures with vast worlds and the amount of things you can do in these worlds and all of this content being accessible enough for the common gamer and Bethesda lacking the competence to make any decision matter in their stories made these games what they are. Accessible pick up and play adventures and worlds for anyone and everyone to explore and get lost in with their brainstorming of.